Good Friday morning. This is, this in the letter to the Philippians, St. Paul is he's urging his his uh, fellow Christians to persevere in imitation of him. Interesting, stick because he's tough. He's in prison to retain the faith, to remain no matter how providence guides us, and no matter the events of life, to remain faithful. And I really I see that today. I see so many of our so many of our fellow Christians and fellow Catholics especially, I see how they have defected. They have left the faith. I don't blame them. Paul is rough here. He's saying their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame. Their minds are occupied with earthly things. I don't, I, it may be, I'm sure it was true of his time and sure the people he's talking to and add about. But that's not what I see in our, our young people. I don't see they look there searching after earthly things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think we have a great conflict of culture right now. And I think, when I think of the 20th century and the 20, and the century before, the, 20, the 20th and the 19th centuries, you can see in some ways the horrors of what have occurred in humanity and the human the community, the world, the horrors of the, the 20th century. And I can see how people come to doubt when I teach my course in the philosophy of religion, I raise this issue. I directly raise the problem of evil in the world. Not the not petty ante stuff, but the serious, serious story. I talk about the Holocaust all the time. The enormity of the horrors of war. 80 million people were killed in the Second World War. And most of them were women and children. Yeah. Now, how do you come to grips with a loving God in that context? I can see how people walk away and say that God is not a believable God. Christ is not a believable Savior. You see? I can see that. I can see how they could come to it. Or as, what is even worse than human suffering is the silence of God amidst human suffering. I think of the Jews in the concentration camps when they prayed for deliverance and they heard nothing in return. It takes a huge act of faith to trust the imminent and immense love of God for us in our hearts and souls. And that's the truth. If all you have is the conventions of faith, that convention's going to be tested fiercely by life. And the only question will be, will you go beyond it? There's something deeper and more trusting. Or will you abandon it? And I can see how easily one can abandon it. And I also, if I can be so completely blunt about it, I think in some ways the piety preached by the church in the past was so hollow and empty. It was saccharine. And how could it have addressed the horrors of the 20th century? I'm thinking of the pieties of the 50s. I can't, I can't imagine how could we have preached some of the silly stuff we were preaching in the 50s in terms of our pieties when you were facing things like the horrors of, the, of 1935 to 1945, that decade of horror. How, where was, in a sense, the conscience, the preaching of the conscience of the church addressing the horrors of evil in the world? We were still worried about eating meat on Friday and missing mass on Sunday. I know those things were important in their own way, but compared to the world we were living in, We were, pre we were preaching, in some ways, the scrupulosity of trivia against the, the enormity of evil that existed in the world. Where is the church's voice addressing the suffering of humanity, massive sufferings of humanity? Individuals certainly did, but in the general praxis of the faith, was it, was it preached in a way that was powerfully authentic? I don't know. I don't ever recall it. It's only afterwards, later, certainly in the post-Vatican II church, when we addressed the global community, and the church sought to, to, to re-evangelize the West and evangelize the world, offering a gospel of hope, of trust that all evil will be overcome. What St. Paul says here in the body of Christ, in this life, the body of Christ on the cross, and the next, the glorified body of Christ. That's the point of the letter to the Philippians here today. You see? So he says, that, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord and the Beloved. Okay? He will change our lowly body to conform with his glorified body by the power 
that enables him also to bring all things into subjection to himself. All things, not just you and me, all things. To God in Christ, through Christ, and in the death and resurrection of Christ, will make all things right. A final rightness, a final rectitude to reality. There has to be something. There has to be hope that there is a final goodness that triumphs over evil, a rightness and a justice over injustice. There has to be a redemption, especially for the suffering of the innocent. Now, or else life's absurd. The existentialists of the 30s, let alone the 40s and 50s, they saw the European community was revulsed by all that it had, had accomplished, all that it had happened. And no wonder the, the existentialists said life is absurd. It's not absurd. And it's not tragic. It's suffering. But it may, and I hope, with suffering, with hope, that suffering's not vain, that death isn't final, that injustice is not permanent, but that there is a final right order of things through the suffering of Christ, the unjust suffering of Christ, who is the ultimate in the innocent, and that all, all suffering, especially the suffering of the innocent, are taken up in Christ's suffering on the cross to Good Friday, is the crucifixion of the innocent, all innocence, transformed into hope and a glorified body in Christ through the suffering, not as an escape clause and not as, you know, uh, what do you call those things, uh, door prize, but as the fulfillment of the suffering, of one's suffering, its fulfillment in glory. It's not vain. I said that all poorly, and I'm sorry for it. It's hard to frame the thought. I think it with my kids in class because I teach in the philosophy of religion, the problem of evil and the existence of God. And I've been more confessional in recent years to the point that I said the other day, I can't speak for anyone else, and I don't. But I see no philosophical justification for the suffering of the world, nor do I find it justified. But I have hope through my faith that there is a final right. And then I quote St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. We fill up those things, wanting in the suffering of Christ. I said, I can't speak for the other guy, but I hold on. I said to him with both hands, both feet, and in my teeth to that one sentence by St. Paul. Because in that one hope, I hope that justice will triumph over injustice, goodness over evil, love over hate. That in the end, there is a primal order, a, a, a rectitude, a, a rightness to all that exists. That the, the eternal, the, uh, the universe, the the, the universe is all redeemed in Christ. There, nothing is vain. Nothing is lost that can be found in Christ. That in Christ's humanity, Christ's humanity, crucified and risen, the world comes together in peace, in a glorified peace where all things are made right. I hope for that very deeply. I am stunned and I'm very aware of the horrors of the life and the injustice of life especially the suffering of the innocent, the children. But I look at that with hope, not in some panacea, but in the transformative power of Christ himself to turn horror, in, horror into glory through his own horror glorified on Good Friday. <laughs>